<laughs> okay, welcome to Psych Incubator and Eminent Psychotherapist Revealed. I'm Jeffrey Magnavita, and we're glad you're joining us tonight. Um, I'm here with my uh, new co-host, Elizabeth Magnavita, who is an early career psychotherapist. We're glad to have her join us. And Michael Alpert um, will be signing in in uh, just a minute. And I'm very pleased uh, this evening to have join us um, Dr. Yeoman, um, who is a um, eminent psychotherapist in his own right, um, and someone that I have uh, known for uh, a number of years, and have uh, read and had as and admired his work um, over over many decades. Um, Frank is a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at the Weill Cornell Medical College and director of training of the, at the Personality Disorders Institute, as well as an adjunct associate clinical professor of psychiatry at Columbia University. Um, he attended Harvard College, Yale University, and interestingly obtained a PhD in French literature and is MD at the Payne Whitney Clinic at the Weill uh, Cornell Medical College for his um, residency in psychiatry. Um, he's done a lot of work, interesting work in the development, investigation, teaching, and practice of psychotherapy with a special emphasis on the treatment of personality disorders. He has taught and helped establish training programs for psychodynamic therapy of personality disorders in many countries and a regular teacher and lecturer at the American Psychiatric Association's annual meetings. He's authored and co-authored a number of volumes, and if you read his bio, you can see those. But without further ado, uh, before we jump in, I do want to say that um, for our Ukrainian colleagues, um, we are here wishing you uh, the best and sending you our support, prayers, and thoughts, and for the Ukrainian people. So uh, with that being um, acknowledged, uh, we'll start off with um, our first question. Yeah, so Dr. Yeomans, we are curious um, about from your perspective, how do you understand the general concept of personality? Well, it's a good place to start. And I think it's good for people in mental health to never forget about the personality that is subtending many symptoms. I think modern psychiatry in particular is too symptom focused. So I like to quote my colleague, I'm sure you know him, Jeffrey, Jonathan Shedler, who yes. says, uh, personality is not what we have, it's who we are. And I think that makes it more interesting to work with personality than just symptoms. So personality has to do with the enduring and underlying psychological patterns that are there underneath the symptoms and the chief complaints. So we're talking about characteristic kind of automatic, spontaneous ways of thinking, feeling, interacting, and increasingly, according to both the DSM system and the ICD system, the understanding of personality is focusing on one's sense of self and one's experience of others. And that's where I think uh, our attention should be concentrated because when people have personality disorders, there's something that's awry in their sense of self and their experience of others. And you know, it just leads to a lot of dissatisfaction, uh, unhappiness, and difficulty functioning in life. So um, you should, you should uh, rewrite the, de the description of personality at the next uh, version of the DSM. It'll, I think it'll help people get oriented in a much more productive manner. I'll do my best. I think I, I would like to do that. Thank you. So I always, I always, um, when I'm um, writing about personality disorders or when I'm treating them, I'm always um, sort of in this tension zone between um, diagnosing and labeling and, and not labeling. And um, in the past, there has, um, in my experience, there's been a, a tremendous amount of stigma when it comes to labeling someone with a personality disorder. In fact, in one of the volumes that I edited years ago, we had a chapter with uh, Otto Kernberg, who's one of your uh, 
uh, colleagues and um, Judith Jordan in the same volume and Judith talking about borderline personality really being a, a, a expression of a complex uh, post-traumatic stress disorder um, generally based on early sexual abuse and most likely to be diagnosed um, in women. And so I'm wondering how you deal with that tension between like whether you whether you you give someone that label and diagnosis or whether you under like underplay it and um, try to avoid it. Well, that's a great topic. First of all, simple answer. I do give the diagnosis and I give psychoeducation with the diagnosis. There's nothing wrong to have a totally valid medical psychiatric condition that is known to the field and has effective treatments to it. And it's far better to discuss it openly than to uh, discuss it euphemistically in a way that keeps people in the dark. Now, there's so much in your comment. Uh, first of all, um, okay. Uh, I, I lost track of a, a different uh, number of the details of what you said, but we do discuss it. When we work with patients, we do our assessment. If we find there's a personality disorder, we say so. Otherwise, you're misleading the patient and you're not informing them about the level upon which they'd be best off thinking. So, oh, I know what I was going to talk about otherwise. Let's try to get back to categories of personality disorder versus dimensions of personality disorder. But anyway, if I've got somebody with a personality disorder, sometimes they say, kind of referring back to what Jonathan Shedler said, what do you mean I have a personality disorder? You're saying there's something wrong with me. Well, if you have a depression, there's something wrong with you. If you're coming for treatment, there's something wrong with me. And trust me, there's been a lot wrong with me, which is why I had my own analysis. So the idea that there's something wrong with a person is kind of why they've come for help to begin with. But people do distinguish between a symptom, which they can often experience like, oh, it's like I'm infected with something versus there's something about my nature I should think about. But why not? We can all benefit from thinking about our nature. The so, part of that that was really lovely was that you said, of course there is, and there is with me too. And yeah. you know, pretty much it's just when you become aware of there's something wrong. <laughs> Otherwise- that we can all improve. Well, one one of the things that I that I that I've written about and talked about is um, that the idea that that under stress many of us can have personality dysfunction, and and that personality dysfunction can become a stable state if if it, it's at the wrong developmental period. Well, I want to talk about that because I agree with you hundred percent. It's not. It's them and us, they who have a personality disorder and we who don't. I think we are all capable of regressing. Now, I'm going to have to introduce a term here, what I call primitive defense mechanisms. These are ways of avoiding anxiety that actually help avoid anxiety, but they do not help you adjust to the world. And the paradigmatic primitive defense is splitting, which is like, I'm all good. Anything aggressive and hostile is out there in the world. You deny your own aggression and hostility, which is part of every human being, and you project it, and thus you live in what we call the paranoid position. The world is dangerous. Are, are we living in that now in some way? With, um, with Let me get to that. So one. when I teach about splitting and about what you just said, I say, look, we're not a different kettle of fish from our patients with borderline personality disorder. Under enough stress, we can all regress to splitting defenses, seeing things in black and white all another. And I always say one circumstance in which a relatively normally constituted person would regress is war. And I hear myself saying that. I say, you know, does that really happen? It happens. This Ukrainian war, this Russian war on Ukraine, I have to tell you, I regressed to splitting. When I saw the atrocities that the Russian army uh, was committing, I wanted to just break off from all of my Russian colleagues, but I had to stop and think, that's splitting. My Russian colleagues aren't Putin. I know they're decent people. 
I have to keep working with them. They're part of the problem. No, I'm sorry, they're part of the solution. They're not part of the problem. But even so, I read about the next atrocity and my gut, because personality disorders have a lot to do with real gut emotions. My gut is to say, to hell with them all. They're all bad. So I agree with you. It's how much stress brings out these primitive reactions in us. Oh, I'm curious about, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Sure. I'm curious about, so, you know, we're talking about how, um, you know, under high amounts of stress or traumatic events can almost turn on the disorder, so to say, or trigger it, or, you know, so you get some tendencies maybe. Um, how do you navigate um, addressing trauma with your patients? Well, it goes back to what Jeffrey said about trauma and personality disorder. That's a whole debate. And I don't see them as totally overlapping. People like to quote the fact that if you look at a population of BPD patients, there've been numerous studies and they tend to show that about two thirds have a history of trauma. So you can say, oh, it's really a post-traumatic disorder. But if you look at a population of subjects from the non-clinical population, just not patients, but general people, and you look at the subset who have experienced trauma, the large majority of traumatized people do not have a personality disorder. So it's about mm -hmm. how the trauma was internalized and processed. So when you get to how I help people with trauma, uh, first of all, it's about being able to tolerate affect states that seem intolerable. I think the best example is a patient I'm remembering who had dissociative identity disorder, formerly known as multiple personality disorder. She would go into fugue states. She would run into the woods. They'd send helicopters chasing after her. She would go to highways to jump uh, off overpasses and when she's back in the office, no memory. Those states were the acting out of intolerable affects. What happens? Those affects need to be present in the therapy sessions. If you create an atmosphere and a setting in therapy where the patient not only understands verbally, but gets it viscerally, that they can experience with you whatever is in them, often in a way that's going to have a huge impact on you and your counter transference. This person could get really scary. I had to tolerate the fear and help her see that one could experience that affect without dissociating from it and passing into action to avoid awareness of affect. So I would say the first step is feeling affects that seem totally overwhelming and intolerable. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that that first question came in because I was going to ask you about dissociative personalities and you've already you've answered that essentially how that fits in. So I don't have to ask it. <laughs> but mm -hmm. but I, I, I'm wondering this, what you're saying right now is seems to me to be extremely important that you, you want people to experience these affects and find some way of doing it without decompensating or having more symptoms. What, what, is, is there, is there a, a core set of techniques you use for helping them deal with these very disruptive emotion, emotional things? Yeah, first of all, and this gets into the ways, the therapy that I, have uh, written about uh, you know, doing with patients transference focused psychotherapy. It's a variant of a more traditional form of therapy. And the first difference is how it's structured. We have a much uh, clearer and more explicit emphasis on the frame of treatment with the belief that if the frame of treatment is really in place, then you have a safe space to feel all of this, that it has to be really clear what the parameters of the treatment are. Then the next step 
is a focus on countertransference. Being aware that in people with, generally in people with severe personality disorder, a lot of what they can't allow themselves to feel is somehow provoked in you. And you have to be aware of this and how what you're feeling might correspond to an unfelt part of the patient's internal world. So that's a quick answer, frame and attention to countertransference. I, I think that's beautiful. I, I, I like to think of borderline personality disorder as actually countertransference disorder. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. I, I haven't heard it put that way, and I like that a lot. I always like to hear new formulations. But oh, I do yeah. want to say something about the trauma. This is where sometimes my colleagues and I are considered unempathic, and I would argue it's the opposite. We're extra empathic. Because if somebody has a simple PTSD, I understand they're victims of trauma. If somebody has a borderline personality disorder, which by the way, extends beyond the narrow DSM description of borderline into a whole range of what we call borderline organization, which is based on that splitting. Splitting off awareness of your own aggressive feelings, seeing them on the outside, experiencing the world from a paranoid point of view. Anyway, if somebody's not a simple PTSD case, but has developed this what we call psychological structure based on splitting, we're never gonna fully help them unless we help them get in touch with their own aggression. Anna Freud said one needed to deal with the identification with the aggressor. It may or may not be that simple, but without awareness of an integration of one's own aggressive feelings, which I think are part of any, any human psyche, you haven't finished the job. The reason I say sometimes we're considered lacking in empathy is some people say our emphasis on bringing awareness of aggression into the picture is mean to the patient. It sort of paints them in a bad way, but we don't see it that way. We think it's just honoring the full range of human emotion. So speaking of, um, you know, talking about aggression, I'm thinking of the patients that I work with at um, the hospital where I work, there are often, you know, pretty aggressive um, people who are dealing with some really, really intense emotions. So working with these people, you know, me and my coworkers, we often find that, of course, there's a lot of, a lot of countertransference um, towards these people. And it's a real challenge trying to find that want to help someone sometimes who, you know, have done some not great thing. So how do you, what's a, a trick or a tip or something where you can help kind of navigate helping them, wanting to help them and also, you know, not condoning what they've done and being there for them also? Well, that's the key. So let me comment on that a little bit. First of all, to get back to the issue of diagnosis, categories versus dimensions, increasingly studies of personality and personality disorder favor a dimensional view. So it's how severe is the personality disorder. One can think of severity in terms of a number of different variables, how in depth are interpersonal relationships, that would be a higher level of personality organization versus how superficial and caricatured are the interpersonal relationships. But another variable that has to do with severity is how much aggression is there in the constitutional makeup of the person's personality. We have to remember that personality is largely biological and genetic, not just the result of development. Anyway, to get back to your question about how to manage aggressive stuff in patients, which sometimes they act out without any awareness, I had a patient whose husband called me up and said, what do I do, doc? I forgot, my, I forgot our wedding anniversary. My wife got really angry at me and she threw the TV across the room at me. In the next session, I said, well, oh, she said, can you, I told you what a monster my husband was. He forgot our anniversary. Can you imagine? I said, well, I understand that's very painful, 
but he did mention to me that you threw the television at him. She said, what else could I do? I was so hurt. This is what I mean, that aggression pass, it bypasses awareness and it gets expressed in action. So you're not doing anybody a favor if you don't help them become aware of it so then they can get mastery of it. So anyway, to get back to your question, I see, to simplify a little bit, two levels of understanding aggression in our patients. In the higher level patients, first of all, let me couch this in terms of what I see as a fundamental conflict in most people's minds. We have loving drives or affects and we have angry aggressive drives and affects. And life is kind of a, kind of a conflict about how to negotiate Love and hate. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So anyway, um, in the higher level patients, these are people who really want to get attached to somebody, but because of their insecurities and what I see is their projection of a negative affect, of an angry, rejecting response, they're really convinced that if they get close to somebody, they're going to be rejected. So they get defensively aggressive and hostile and rejecting of the other. So that's one way to tolerate a patient's aggression, to see it as a defensive reaction to a very kind of understandable longing for closeness that they think is futile and hopeless. So you always have to think, what are they defending against with their aggression? But if you get to the lower level, and this is where therapists have the most difficulty, some people get pleasure in being aggressive. Some people have a somewhat sadistic nature. And unless you can empathize with that and help the person see that some of their aggressive behavior is a source of pleasure and satisfaction, and maybe they'd be better off being aware of that and then making conscious decisions about what to do with that. Unless you can empathize with that frame of mind, you're not gonna help these lower level people. Mm -hmm. When you say empathize, can you describe how you empathically connect with that patient? Well, that's a very good question. Um, it gets back to why I like a psychoanalytic approach. I think a psychoanalytic approach honors the full range of the human emotional and psychological experience. And as an advocate of that approach, I feel we all within us have very primitive urges, fears, wishes, fantasies. So I think the way to empathize with somebody who gets pleasure out of making, I mean, I'm thinking about a patient, she would really enjoy making me squirm, saying things in the session that made me like really uncomfortable. And I sort of had to help her see this. She did it so instinctively without awareness, I thought she'd be better off knowing it. So I had to conjure up in my mind, you know, could I, in some fantasy level, imagine, you know, that it could be pleasurable getting somebody else to squirm and feel uncomfortable. And if you can imagine that and empathize that with that on a fantasy level, you can help them become more aware of it. So I have an interesting question um, that I'd like to uh, pose from one of our um, viewers, when the client has gradually come to experience affect after years of dissociation to some degree with the safety of a healthy therapeutic alliance, a good fit, is your experience that the client comes to experience affect with varying degrees of common existential anxiety? If this is the process, what do you offer for coping methods? Well, um, thanks for the question. Yeah, it's a very good question. It's a terminology that isn't the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, so I'll translate it a little bit into, I mean, the existential anxiety I think I get. And if you're a thinking person, at some point you have existential anxiety. But from my theoretical framework, I think in terms of Melanie Klein's concept of the paranoid schizoid position, which is what I've described earlier, your mind is split you project the angry, aggressive part, you see it in the outside world, so you have a generally paranoid experience of the world. Interestingly, when one 
advances beyond that splitting and projection into a more integrated mind that takes in the aggression and awareness of it, two things happen. One is you've given up the idea and the desire that you can find perfection in self or other. So you have to work that through and come to terms with that. But more relevant to the question, part of achieving the, in my mind, healthier depressive position is you become aware of your aggression and then you feel guilt and remorse. So I think that has to do with the existential anxiety. You have to help people come to terms with the whole range of who they are. The fact that this might not all be uh, exactly the way they'd like to see themselves, but with the basic belief that awareness helps gain mastery, helps adapt better to the world and find more satisfaction in the way you live it, your life and the relations you can establish with others. And by the way, one thing to get back to the existential anxiety that I find is very present in successful terminations is when the patient realizes that there are some problems that are just are complex. Even therapy, the best therapists in the world can't just solve these problems for them. And part of adapting successfully to the world is to take on these complex issues that any person would have uh, some kind of struggle figuring out. So this is, by the way, the appeal of fascist regimes. It used to drive me crazy when people would say, oh, I don't like Hillary Clinton because you ask her a question, she gives eight answers. Well, maybe it's a complex issue where there are different perspectives. But if, say, in the debate, Donald Trump says, oh, that's easy. I have the answer to that. People love that. It's well, really they, disturbing. They, they, this talking about you know, how the, the aggressive impulses, which are in all of us, um, and can be give us a sense of being safe. You know, they protect us. We we, we wore off the enemy mm -hmm. and you know beat them back and defeat mm -hmm. them, and then we feel better. And you know the but our aggression is justified. Like my patient who's right. throwing the TV with this is this, this is this is ripping apart our political debate because it's basically saying you know. If you rip apart the people you're debating, if you encourage people yeah. supporting you to rip everyone apart, you're you're playing to that. And there's a tremendous a lot of people really get off on it. It's horrible, and I hope we can move back into a more <laughs> rational <laughs> discourse without this splitting and 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 polarization. But the problem is that it's an illusion to think we live in the age of reason. I mean, we all love the enlightenment. Our constitution was based on enlightenment ideas, but the enlightenment was based on the idea that reason prevails. What we've learned, not just from psychoanalysis, but just from observing everything around us, is emotions prevail over reason. Mm -hmm. So, we, so need, we need to educate people on how to deal with these emotional things, how to help them with that. And do better I, with it. I think that should be part of every public school and private school curriculum. It should be there, basic psychology, but psychology along the lines of what you're saying, how our minds function, what to watch out for, what not to be victim to when emotions tend to prevail over reason. So, so Frank, I want to bring I want to bring it back to something close to, to me in a way that that um that I deal with every day, like um, what, what does it take in a therapist to do the work that you do? Like, what does it take to sit with people who are splitting, who can be sadistic, who want to see, who want to, want to see you squirm, who um, maybe have uh, unbearable envy to you? And how, what, what are the therapeutic qualities that you look for in therapists in training or people who want to do this work with more severe disorders, more severe personality um, presentations? What do you 
what do you look for in your in your trainees? What do you think makes a, a, a therapist that can be effective in this way? Because it's to me what you're saying, it's less about the technical aspects and more about some kind of therapeutic capacity in the therapist? Well, it's a great question and I can't give a definite answer. It probably does have more to do with a person's own access to deep emotional and fantasy states. I think that can be helped along by one's own therapy, one's own analysis. But to really enter into the heart of darkness, to use a metaphor of one's own emotions, to go through that and come out and have the awareness and the mastery at the same time. But for whatever reason, some people find that very threatening. When I was running a unit at the hospital, we would send those of our staff who were interested to Tavistock model group relations conferences, which are really intense experiences that bring up a lot of primitive emotions. And the staff would come back from that experience. Most of them would say, wow, that was really fascinating. And I would know those were the ones who would go on to be good analytic therapists who can deal with emotion in depth like this. Some would come back and say, that's the craziest experience I've ever been to. They are all insane. I don't want to go near that again. I don't know why the person couldn't deal with the affective arousal, but those were the people, and I, I'm saying this in a way that sounds more critical than I mean to be, they would go into CBT types of therapy because I don't think you get as involved in the emotional depth. Yes, I, I remember when I was in training in Montreal with Davin Lowe, one of the techniques he used to use was he we would, we would be in front of a, our group and we'd present a video. And if there was a point where there was tremendous we had tremendous difficulty with affect. He would encourage us to, to watch that video vignette over and over again to kind of uh, be able to help us work through whatever it was in our unconscious that would allow us to tolerate it. Because it seems to me like what you're saying and what I experience is the tolerance of our own affective states and the, and the affective states of people in distress is, is essential. But yeah. what, what, why would, what's wrong with us that we do this work? Um, there's nothing wrong with us. Let's, I mean, I'm going to get political again, but I mean, whether it's kind of uh, the totalitarianism you find in some other countries or the rampant capitalism we find in our own country, the system wants to people to produce more than to have a full life of deep experience. What, I mean, I, I'm all for contributing to society, but the, there's nothing wrong with doing what we're doing. We're trying to keep in our culture an experience of what it is to be human that's rich and profound rather than kind of operational and transactional. That feels validating, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to add to that. I, th I think that what, our calling gives us the opportunity to be connected with feelings more because we're working with people and trying to help them be in touch more. That means we have to be in touch more too to work with them. And, you know, I think rather than being disrupted by these feelings, if these are like that mixture of flavors that Frank described and you know, the angry flavors and the loving flavors and the lost flavors and the pains and the, that it becomes an incredibly pleasurable experience. It, it's, it's like, you know. Yeah. At times, at times, but incredibly unbearable at other times, like to sit with people in unbearable pain and to feel so powerless and helpless to me is excruciating at times. But it's excruciating. You can tolerate it if you sense the person's potential to get out of it. Uh, to get a, a little further into what Michael was saying, sometimes I see our work as liberating people from a straitjacket that their mind keeps them in. Mm -hmm. And we help them move beyond that straitjacket, that narrow, rigid sense of what it is to be human to a much more full and complex one. 
Mm-hmm. I think another piece of this kind of work is you have to be able to see the that people can change and that things can get better for them and that, you know, there's hope basically. How do you, I, I've been thinking about this a lot. How do you help instill a sense of hope in people who maybe feel like, you know, things aren't going to get better. Things will never change for me. Like this is the way it is um, to basically see that there, there is hope that things can get better. Yeah. I think you communicate that through your words and through your attitude. It kind of goes back to uh, that topic we were discussing, whether you talk about the diagnosis with the patient or not. And I, as I said, do like to say, first of all, I say, I think what you have falls in the broad domain of personality disorders. And I give a layman's description of that, which basically is when your gut level way of experiencing yourself and others is very narrow, extreme, and rigid. And then I say, uh, you know, a personality disorder just keeps a person locked into ways that inhibit them and don't resolve conflicts for them. So when I talk about what a personality disorder is, I say, but, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. There are effective treatments. And if we understand your difficulty this way. And I, I often say to the person, I wouldn't be proposing t- this treatment to you if I didn't see the potential in you to move beyond this. I have a question from our, one of our viewers. Have you integrated any spirituality into your therapeutic approach? Or your Only in my own life. Because um, I think spirituality is an important part of life. And um, It's not part of my model of psychotherapy, but I think it helps a person ground oneself and Mm -hmm. have a fuller sense of what life is about. But even though I don't include spirituality per se, what is really interesting is the role of a moral value system. Because if you're talking about people who have a personality disorder, they usually don't have a coherent sense of themselves And part of a coherent sense of self is a coherent sense of values. And I can't tell you how many of my patients, as they're getting better, spontaneously from them, they say, you know, I've been thinking about my values and I've come to realize I'm not so clear about that. And I want to really develop a clearer and better sense of values. And that's very gratifying. So that, that's, that's lovely. I mean, I think, I think having that experience, you know, I mean, what more could you ask for? You're not only helping them to feel better, but they're, they're beginning to become a better person. Yeah. Which yeah. is an ad, added bonus, which nobody has counted on. The, the, the thing that I think, Jeffrey, you said it's, it's unbearable. Um, the I think more than I can bear sometimes. I think there's a dosing issue, and and I think you know I think I, I think Frank was talking about that when he was describing how people learn to do things that are unbearable for people. That it it, it may be maybe a defensive maneuver that they're expressing whatever it is in a way that is unbearable. I I remember I had a patient who who had become so she was describing uh, something or she was very frustrated with and after when she had been brutalized as a child by a, a parent, she, she would suddenly begin, take her fist and begin to smash herself in the face. And I, it was unbearable just, just to even see it. I said, you have to stop, I can't stand this. Mm-hmm. I, and, and then we, 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 I, we'd had to keep stopping it and stopping it and, and reducing the way she, it was done to a much milder way and, and but it, 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 it took a, a long time for me to realize that, that actually, you know, I, why, I, why she was doing it became clear in terms of why she was essentially taking the, uh, joining her, her abusive parent. And right. it didn't work. But it, it, it's, it's, it's difficult when things like that happen. It is, but in that situation, I would suggest to the woman, 
I know this sounds a little crazy, but I think you're doing that to not feel something. I mean, it looks to all the world like you're doing something that's inflicting pain on yourself, but I think it's actually trying to escape from something that would feel worse if you let yourself feel it. Thank you. I never thought of that. But this, but this, but that I think I think what you both are illustrating is a very interesting interesting technical kind of issue. Like, um, is there a time when you have to just say stop it? I don't know if you've ever seen the the Bob Newhart stop it. <laughs> yes. But but there's a point when when sometimes I find myself say just stop it, stop it. Like when someone's doing that, maybe not. I mean, I've had patients that have punched themselves in the head. Um, and, and, but when there's some, when they're verbally punching themselves, like, and making me watch, sometimes I'll, I'll say that. And then maybe I'll do what you suggest, Frank, and say, you know, but, but it seems like the, the, the technical for me, the, the, the gut thing is get them to stop it first. Like, like, like I wouldn't let my kid run out in front of a, uh, a car, I would, I would stop it. So what do you think about that, Frank? Well, and that, that gets see. back to what I was saying earlier about structuring and framing the treatment right from the get-go. So if there are any indications in the assessment we get, for our assessment of the patient and the history we get of behaviors that are distinctly harmful and usually harmful behaviors are also treatment interfering behaviors. We say, you know, should this come up in the course of this therapy, this is what this therapy calls for. You're making every effort to refrain from that. We believe that that's a way to not feel something. It disarms us, it takes away what we need to do the work, which is the affect, the emotion that underlies it. So we set up, it's kind of like, this is a terrible metaphor, but I'll use it anyway suffer the consequences. It's like setting up the ropes around a boxing ring. It's like in this space, anything can be felt because nothing is going to move beyond this space and nothing is going to happen in this space that's literally harmful and dangerous physically. The well, other I, thing, but I think you, I, I mean, I, I, I think that, I mean, that sounds lovely, but I'm not sure I am able to set that those kind of ropes around people. I, I've had patients who try to jump through my window and during a session, and jump out my window during a session and like had to like tackle them to get them from jumping out my window. And, no, no, and I've had that too. Um, or patients that have climbed through the window of our waiting room, of our administrative office and wound up in my office on my couch. I mean, it, there, there's, you know, there's acting out. And I think Lizzie works with a lot more patients that live in that realm, but we get yeah. them occasionally. And then, and then how do you, you well, know, you I mean, it? clearly one has to work on setting limits. Now, what you just said is setting the limits doesn't always work. And of course it doesn't always work, but this may be a little sidebar to go into. Most of those of us who specialize in borderline personality disorder have taken a distance from the idea that when the person is like totally emotionally aroused, they have zero control. We all agree they have less control, but our experience both in what I hear from some DBT colleagues and what we do in TFP is there's, you can appeal to that part of the patient that still can exert some control and your appeal to it helps them know it's there because too often people accept the myth that when they're aroused, they have no control. So with the patient who says to me, I'm going to jump out the window right in front of you. Um, first, I haven't had to grab them. I've had to grab patients doing other things, but that's another story. Um, so uh, similar, the patient said she was going to run out of the office and kill herself. I had to grab her. So, but ultimately, we take the position, I believe that if you muster up every ounce of effort in you, you can not give in to this kind of thing. Maybe I'm wrong. Time will tell. If you try to follow my advice, we can continue to work together. If I'm wrong and you can't stop this form of acting out, 
then you need more of a case management treatment than I can provide. I'm providing a treatment that is trying to look at the depths of your feeling states to uncover things of which you're not aware. And you're not aware of them because it's painful to be aware of them. It's not like you just haven't figured them out. It's painful to have this awareness. That's the work we're doing. If even with our best effort, you cannot avoid repeated dangerous acting out, at least for this point in time, you need more of a case management. Have you, have you ever tried saying to them, I was thinking about this as Jeffrey's describing it and you're describing it, sharing your reaction. You know, it is, it, it, it's so painful to hear you suffer this way, to see you hurting yourself this way. And I wouldn't go hurt. into that. I'll tell you why. In a, well, do you want to say more? No, it's enough. Go ahead. Because usually uh, I, my patients have one of two reactions. We use countertransference a lot, as we were speaking about before, but we don't reveal it because sometimes if I say, well, you know, this is what I'm feeling, my patient says, well, you should talk about that in your therapy. We're not here to talk about what you're feeling. We're here to talk about what I'm feeling. So that's one response I get, you know, okay, you feel that that's your issue. But I could imagine a lot of patients say, oh, you see, that just shows what a bad person I am. I'm making you feel bad. So what I like to do and this gets back to tolerating the very difficult emotions. And I do this myself and I try to instill this in my patients. You have to distinguish between who you are and who the transference object is. One patient at the end of a session, I said, well, it's time to leave. And she said, oh yeah, I just have one more thing before I, before I go. <laughs> I said, oh, well, okay. And she said, I, I just had to tell you, from the moment I first met you, I thought you were the most revolting, disgusting person I ever laid eyes on. And it I almost makes me vomit every time I see you. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, we'll have to discuss that in the next session. <laughs> I mean, that could hurt. It, maybe it's because it was so exaggerated. But, you know, that's her transference object. But let me give you another example. That's just pushing you away with style. <laughs> but let, let me give you an example. We don't correct distortions. We immerse ourselves in the distortion to help the patient get to know it. Patient, mid-30s, angry, hostile, highly narcissistic and borderline guy. You see people like that in the hospital, I can tell Lizzie. Mm -hmm. So usually he devalues me and criticizes me and finds fault with everything I say. In one session, he was telling me a story from his childhood that was so sad, it brought tears to my eyes. So he looks at me and he says, you have tears in your eyes. So I said, yes. I mean, I didn't know what else to say. I just validated his perception. He scrutinizes me for a minute and he says, you're mocking me. <laughs> that, that blew me away because that was the transference Wonderful. object he's projecting out of me i didn't say no please believe me, i'm really empathizing with you we have to let him get to know what he's projecting better so i said tell me more about that why would i be what would motivate me to mock you oh you're just like everybody else you pretend to be nice but you just like to sort of stick it to people so you just let yourself become the transference object and you hover above the interaction and you observe it and you try to engage the patient in observing it with you. Now, isn't this what uh, Freud uh, called the concept of neutrality? Yeah. Now, when I've done some deep uh, research into Freud's cases, even though he wrote about neutrality, he used to take patients on vacation with him. <laughs> I don't like understand. I, I, I was trained psychoanalytically uh, or psychodynamically and um, in, 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 in neutrality. And I just, it just, I just have trouble with that kind of like total neutrality. Well, I, remember, I remember a patient one time I was working with she came in and she had trouble talking to me for months. She just couldn't even hardly verbalize. She was so anxious. And I used to sometimes drink coffee uh, in session a long time ago. And one day she brought me a cup of coffee and I started to analyze it. And I started to say like, you know, what me, and then it, it just so re-traumatized her that I, that I, that I, that like going forward, I just learned to say, thank you. <laughs> was, yeah. 
I, I understand that, and I don't know enough to go into that case, but I do want to make a little bit of an argument in favor of neutrality. It's very- I thought odd. you would. Yeah, it's very out of favor these days, particularly the relational school yes, right. with emphasis on co-construction, that anybody who believes in that, uh, neutrality is naive and doesn't get it. But I agree with you, there's no 100% neutrality. And when we talk about neutrality, we don't mean being like a robot, talking impersonally. We talk in a natural style with people, but we try not to intervene on one side or the other of their conflict. So we don't reveal a lot. We don't give opinions. We let it all pour out. And even though we know that we communicate some things by what we say or how we say it, we think if we're neutral enough, then the patient's internal world is what unfolds in front of you. It's not so much a co-construction as the panoply of personae who populate the patient's internal world, like the guy who saw me with tears in my eyes and was convinced I was mocking him. But don't you think some patients need a real relationship with us? Like, like, um, like, a, like depending where they are developmentally, they need um, that. To me, sometimes neutrality can be sadistic. Well, I think it's always a real relationship. I mean, it's how you define the relationship. And of course, some patients, depending on their diagnosis or depending on where they are in their life trajectory, I'm, I'm not advocating the kind of neutral stance and more analytic stance that I'm talking about for everybody. You have okay. to select so the right selective. Thing. Yeah. But what I'm talking about, let me give you a little example. When I set the frame of treatment, in addition to time and fee, and I talk about what our roles are. And I say, you know, your role is to speak as freely as you can without censoring, with some connection to the problems that brought you here, because we've learned that people can free associate in a defensive, evasive way. And my role is to help you understand things you don't know about yourself that have a big impact on how you feel, what you think, and what you do. So we're on this kind of journey of discovery and it's exploration. And my job is to help you understand things. I'm not here to give advice or to join with you in solving problems. So I think that's a real relationship. A patient comes in, 35 year old woman, desperate to get married and have family, never successful in love. She comes in and says, this guy started dating. He tells me, yesterday he asked me to marry him. What should I do? Now she's asking me to be quote, more real. I don't think that's the way I can help her more. So I said, well, uh, if you remember, you know, my giving advice isn't the way I think I could be most helpful to you in this therapy. Doctor, don't be an asshole. Your theories are fine when life is just as usual. Don't you understand? This is I, when I need you and you're abandoning me, when I need you most. That's when I would go into transference analysis. I would look at the representation of self and other underlying that that I think is going to help her more. I'd say, if you can just bear with me a minute, let's look at your experience of you and your experience of me right now. You've got this major life decision. You feel totally incapable of thinking about it in any useful way. And at the same time, you see me as some kind of godlike figure who knows what the right answer is. If that's a kind of a common way that you experience yourself helpless, useless, and you experience the other all-knowing, omnipotent, that could interfere with establishing relationships that work. So maybe the way you're experiencing me now really gets back to the trouble you have throughout your life with getting close to somebody and having it work out. So you could say, I'm not being real with her, but I think I'm being real and sticking to role and helping her at a deeper level. So do you make, in that case, would you make a transference past link? interpretation? Like, would you link it back to the genetic? No. No? I don't think, I think genetic interpretations are less useful than here and now interpretations. They take you away from the immediate affect. But don't they help you with the pattern recognition that you were, you were playing the, the, the relationship you had with this figure with me right now, and this is a recurrent? I don't, 
has have anything against that unless it becomes the central line of interpretation because I think it's too intellectualized and I think it's too removed from the immediate affect the person has with you because it doesn't matter as much to me who did what to them when they were young. What matters to me now is who's doing what to them in their current internal world. And to be aware of that and see how that's what's get activated. We don't think transference is the repetition of the past in the present. We think transference is the activation of the internal representations that exist in the patient's mind, the activation of those personas. Well, where do they come from though? It doesn't matter as much. I mean, it has oh. some relevance. I don't think it matters as much where they come from as who they are in the patient's mind because they're never literal representations of what happened in the past. What happened in the past is elaborated by the patient's fears, fantasies, wishes. So what's in the mind is larger than life. Look, look, people, people are going to replay things over and over for a long time. I mean, that's why therapy takes so long because you don't learn it in one play. I think, I think, and, and I want to get your take on this. My sense is that the, you, the more you can help them to discuss discover these things and deal with them in a way that works better for them and informs them and helps them to grow, the better they do. But they have to keep redoing that. A, mm -hmm. They have to keep re keep working through in these difficult about. areas. It also has to do with the biology of the brain because we know from brain studies that in a lot of our patients, the limbic system, particularly the amygdala is hyperactive the prefrontal cortex, the cognitive system is less active. And, you know, our neuroscientists with whom we work have helped us see how it's that repetition you just described that eventually shifts brain activity to a lessening of the intensity of the activation of the amygdala and an increase in the activity of the prefrontal cortex. So the more they experience these things and handle them in, in more effective ways, the more it shifts. Yeah, right. So unfortunately, we are about out of time. It went by so quickly. Um, I want to thank everyone who is um, watching tonight. And uh, thank you, Frank, for illuminating uh, providing such illuminating insights into the work of uh, severe personality disorders and your expertise is, um, is always uh, interesting for our, us and our viewers. Um, we're gonna hang around for about 15 minutes afterwards for those of you who want to hang out with us while we talk and you can submit some questions. Uh, so we're gonna stop our formal part of our presentation now and we'll be here if you wanna hang out with us for another 15 minutes. So thank you all and we'll see you next month. Thank you.